Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. Today I'll read from a book titled Avant-Garde as Method, Vutemas and the Pedagogy of Space, uh, 1920-1930, by Anna Bokov, published by Park Books. One year after the Bolshevik Revolution, while still in the throes of civil war, Soviet Russia instituted a sweeping educational reform, reorganizing, among other things, art, architecture and design schools. In order to educate the newly empowered proletarian masses, Vladimir Lenin's government created higher art and technical studios collectively known as Vutemas. Conceived as a specialized educational institution for advanced artistic and technical training, Vutemas was established in order to prepare highly qualified artist practitioners for the modern industry. The new school combined eight departments – painting, sculpture, architecture, woodworking, metalworking, ceramics, graphics and textiles. By merging the arts with former craft and new industrial production disciplines, the Bolshevik masterminds created a synthetic educational model from what had historically been considered the autonomous domains of art and of technical expertise. From its establishment, the interdisciplinary school was to bring together academic and avant-garde approaches in order to grant fair representation to various artistic visions of the time. Vutemas offered free education and accepted students from underprivileged backgrounds, many of whom lacked artistic talent or academic standing and were often without secondary education. While similar to the Staatliche Bauhaus in its communistic spirit, Vutemas was over 10 times larger than its German counterpart in terms of the student body. With an enrollment of more than 2,000 students, it was an unprecedented modern undertaking, rivaled only by the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, which counted well over a thousand students in the 1920s. The deep crisis following World War I brought Russia and Germany closer together. The two became close allies not only in economic and political spheres, but also in the sphere of culture. Subsequent revolutionary events were welcomed by the progressive intellectual elites in both countries. Organized by like-minded uh, leftist individuals, Vutemas and the Bauhaus were fundamentally aligned in their conception to bring about radical change. Both schools had chosen architecture and industrial design as their focus, fields that were rather inert and conservative compared with painting, poetry and music, albeit with different emphasis. While at the Bauhaus, architecture was initially seen as the culmination of all the disciplines of practical art, at Vutemas it was conceived as an equal component within the overall curriculum, along with the fine arts and production design. The story of Vutemas begins with the Soviet educational reform of 1918 and the foundation of its precursor, the Free State Art Studios, followed by a Sovnarkom decree that established Vutemas in the fall of 1920. It ends with the school's abrupt shutdown by Stalin's government in 1930. While this book focuses primarily on the single decade of the school's existence, it does consider a wider time frame, starting with the turmoil of World War I and the Russian Revolution and concluding in the mid-1930s with Stalinism and the emergence of Soviet realism, the official style of Soviet culture, signaled by the competition for the design of the Palace of the Soviets. In this way, it is possible to assess the long-term impact of Vutemas once the avant-garde was effectively sidelined and to speculate about its lasting relevance. The current state of knowledge on Vutemas remains limited and at times inaccurate, limited due to a dearth of published sources, the language barrier and the political confrontation between the West and the Soviet Union, which lasted for decades. The few resources that are available are not easy to interpret, like the enigmatics down poetry of the Russian Cuba futurist, the language of Soviet rationalist and constructivist is difficult to understand, often being camouflaged in proto-communist rhetoric due to the ideological pressure of the state. Thus, part of this project lies in deciphering and analyzing key texts and images by the avant-garde protagonists who happen to be teaching at Vutemas. 
the canonized history of modernism would benefit immensely from paying closer attention to the historical role of the school, which to this day has been relegated to a footnote, especially when compared with the attention accorded to the Bauhaus. Despite its limited legacy today, Wutemas was by no means unknown at the time. The most prominent event that put it on the international stage was the 1925 Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs et Industriels Modernes in Paris. Its student projects received the Grand Prix, a testament to a pedagogy that was then barely five years old. This book is grounded in the works and texts of the Wutemas faculty and students. It examines the interdisciplinary institution through the lens of a statewide campaign for accessible mass education, which offer unprecedented opportunities to formerly marginalized groups. The central objective is to analyze the qualities of a new type of school that were formative for and contributed to the development of this ambitious social and artistic agenda by tracing its historical origins, theoretical foundations and pedagogical methods. Above all, its principal focus falls on the teaching and practice of those educators who personified this mission. A central protagonist, therefore, is architect Nikolai Ladovsky. He is closely followed by two other Wutemas professors, Alexander Rodchenko, whose creative and pedagogical approaches were developed in tandem with Ladovsky starting in 1919, and by Lisinski, who was Ladovsky's colleague in the mid-1920s. A key member of the Wutemas faculty and a progenitor of the Soviet architectural avant-garde, Ladovsky remains a largely elusive figure. Notwithstanding his immense contribution to the discipline, he is one of the least recognized among his contemporaries. Arguably, his greatest achievement lay in architectural pedagogy and in developing a new model of collaborative practice. As one of the major figures of Wutemas, Ladovsky harnessed the immense creative energy of the post-revolutionary period. Indeed, one could say that his progressive teaching methods and his systematically constructed pedagogy served as an icebreaker for modern architecture. The challenge of educating the masses while simultaneously coming up with a new way of thinking about the discipline of architecture itself required a coherent theory and a well-designed program in which every exercise strategically prepared its participants for the next. The artistic training of hundreds of students, many of whom came from peasant and working class backgrounds and often lacked secondary education, was a monumental undertaking in itself. Yet, its larger significance was in developing an educational and research model capable of conceiving a totalizing vision as a key building block for the new classless society. Together with his colleagues, architect Vladimir Krinsky and Nikolai Dokuchev, Ladovsky developed a design discipline called space. Referred to as architectural propedeutics by the Soviet scholars, this was a system of core exercises developed to provide foundational training in art and architecture to hundreds of students. The key aspects of Ladovsky's rationalist doctrine, developed as part of his space course, encompass the so-called objective or psychoanalytical method. This method was based on standardized instruction, experimental model making and scientific research, all conceived of in relation to the study of spatial form. For Ladovsky, form was not exhausted by the productivist notion of function or structure, as it was for his constructivist contemporaries, many of whom also taught at the school. Nor was it founded on the functionalist approach best articulated by his Western European contemporaries Le Corbusier and Walter Gropius, who looked at architecture through the criteria of economy as simply a matter of technique and treated buildings as machines equivalent to the range of mass production objects. Instead, for Ladovsky, architecture was first and foremost a spatial form, grounded in the objective laws and universal properties. The criteria for articulating these properties or elements lay in what he called the utmost human need, that of orientation in space. Ladovsky's tenets must be considered through the lens of the period's discourse on aesthetics and psychophysiological sciences. 
The concept of what he called ratio architecture was founded on the idea of a dual rationality, based not only on conventionally understood economy of materials, but also on economy of psychic energy. Ladovsky's space course offered one of the earliest alternatives to the traditional form of architectural training, the classical academic atelier and its system of apprenticeship under a master. Instead of copying the masters and later practice under the master, the new approach introduced the propedeutic training based on systematic instructions and advanced training based on comradely competition and collective work. Originally developed for architects, space quickly became mandatory for all Wutema students, regardless of their future specialization. By 1923, it had entered the school's core curriculum, alongside three other parallel courses, Volume, Color and Rochenko's uh, Graphics. This foundational quartet was organized under the edges of a special administrative unit called the Core Division. In 1925, the Wutemas Core Division counted close to 500 students. Studio instruction, the key practice of mass education, was structured by developing a sequence of standardized tasks. Step-by-step -step algorithmic operations were designed to guide the students through a set of formal exercises, starting with the most basic assignments. Given a rectangular prism of certain proportions, for example, students were asked to express and counteract a mechanical force such as gravity, thereby engaging both their creative intuition and their analytical skills. This highly constrained system with no preconceived result was reinforced by the process of collective production. The implementation of this historic effort to standardize the foundations of design methodology are reflected in the transformation of these assignments over several major periods of the school's evolution. Ladovsky's at times esoteric ideas about form and space and their integration into the curriculum resulted in experimental teaching methods that largely reshaped design education from an elitist academic practice into one accessible to many. Yet his pedagogical challenge lay not only in training large groups of students, but also in leveraging their diversity. As a result, education and experiment were closely intertwined at Wutemas and supported by the psychotechnical laboratory. Ladovsky first mentioned the need to set up such a laboratory in 1921 at the Institute of Artistic Culture, but was not able to realize it until 1927. In this laboratory, he and his colleagues tested the professional prowess of students and in particular their aptitude for spatial assessment, which they deem essential to potential architects. Their goal was to develop objective criteria for a theory of architectural science. Although these experiments were short-lived and limited in scope, the rationalists managed to establish a fundamental reciprocity between design pedagogy and scientific research. The mandate for standardized, universally accessible education was framed within the larger nationwide project of the industrialization of the Soviet economy and the grounding of everything from artistic to labor practices in science. Wutemas' faculty emphasized the link between design practice and the so-called scientific organization of labor that was being carried out by the Central Institute of Labor, according to Taylorist principles in these very same years. Continuous feedback between the educational process, research and tests performed at various scientific research laboratories at Wutemas ensured constant innovation in design and led to an enormous leap in the development of modern space and form. Ernest's attempts to resolve the proverbial conflict between science and creativity permeated Soviet culture. Indeed, Wutemas' faculty sought to resolve the problem of individual creativity in a scientific manner by applying the conceptual apparatus of aesthetic theory, experimental psychology, theoretical physics and even mathematics to problems of art and architecture. The most important platform for original experimentation at Wutemas was, in the end, the core curriculum. One of its main contributions was the introduction of a study model as both a design tool and didactic device. 
While model making had long been an integral part of the design process, it had traditionally been based on existing designs. The method used in the space course specifically challenged students to think spatially and work directly in three dimensions, invoking the dual notion of experimental learning, or learning by doing, one of the foundational pillars of the early Soviet educational system. When starting a model, students often had no idea of its final form. The result was integral to the experience of making. Neither external function nor scale were initially imposed on the design process. Rather, it meant to articulate the intrinsic logic of spatial form and its governing forces. In this respect, the models were not entirely unlike the laboratory constructions by other renowned Vutemas professors, constructivists Alexander Rodchenko, Varbara Stepanova, Lyubov Popova, Alexander Vesnit and Vladimir Tatlin. This book explores the emergence and deployment of what was regarded as a universally valid pedagogy within early 20th century Soviet art, architecture and design education, using Vutemas as a site where the tenets of mass education were conceived, tested and practiced. Ultimately, this book explores the conceptual relationship between experimental psychology, aesthetics and architecture, focusing in particular on the ways in which Vutemas pedagogy had broader implications for modernism. Over and beyond its presentation of a historical narrative, it raises a number of fundamental questions about design education, many of which continue to resonate today. What alternatives are there to the classical academic or apprenticeship-oriented approach to pedagogy? How can one teach something that has no precedent? How does a society go about teaching hundreds or even thousands of students of diverse backgrounds and varied abilities? What is the role of collectivity in learning? What is the function of standardized assignments as compared to individual instruction in design pedagogy? How does the logic of experimentation apply to the educational process? Such questions challenge the conventional understanding of pedagogy as a mere vehicle of knowledge transfer by recasting it as an agent for generating knowledge. They reframe the classroom as a design laboratory, thereby converting mechanical learning into extemporaneous creativity. Anna Bokov holds a PhD from Yale University and is a member of the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. The book was designed in Zurich uh, by Bonbon and printed in Germany by DZA. As for it at your local bookstore, thank you very much for watching this video and uh, see you in the next one. Bye.